Hi everybody. Today we will discuss about hypertonic saline nebulization in bronchiolitis. And I am Dr. A. Padmanathan. Hypertonic saline is something which we often use in clinical practice. It's a very common thing, especially among youngsters. And we will dwell into see whether we have the evidence for in support of the use of in bronchiolitis. Now first we go into the, some of the background information. In regarding this matter. Hyper, the hypertonic saline improves both mucus rheology and mucus, mucociliary clearance in vitro. With clinical the, what you mean by mucus rheology is it, it improves the elasticity and viscosity and clinical studies in cystic fibrosis have demonstrated beneficial effect. Now this is something in the western world in hypertonic saline has been used for many years in cystic fibrosis and bronchiolitis has a number of pathophysiological features including increased mucus production, airway edema and mucus plugging which be, could be potentially amenable to treatment with hypertonic saline because they do share some of the pathological features. It seems that what works for cystic fibrosis should also be working for um, uh, bronchiolitis. And another mechanism of action of hypertonic saline is rehydration of the airway surface liquid. Again, the evidence is not very is not direct. Now let's look now let's look into the issues in research of bronchiolitis. What are the primary difficulties in the, is the lack of an internationally recognized bronchiolitis? It's really surprising that a very common condition like bronchiolitis, there is no in, uh, there is a disparity in the a definition of bronchiolitis. In UK, Australasia and some parts of Europe, the diagnosis is based on the presence of cough, tachypnea and widespread crackles. In fact, if you go to UK, it's usually said and when there is a cold, when there is a cold which goes to the chest, the patient, they call it a bronchiolitis and the mothers are told when your child has fast breathing, whenever he has a cold, please come, it might be a bronchiolitis. Uh, in North America and many other parts of the world, bronchiolitis, especially in North America, the bronchiolitis is diagnosed when a young child has a first episode of wheeze with increased work of breathing in the presence of an upper respiratory tract infection. This is something with the American, with the Britishers don't like to use the word wheeze for bronchiolitis, though we often hear bron bees in bronchiolitis. But since, therefore, this is not the, therefore, this is. Therefore, there's a fundamental difference in the, uh, in the definition. Now, the definition will invariably uh, impact, impact the uh, study inclusion criteria and the ability to extrapolate results to different population. Now, this is not the only thing. There's another major problem in the studies are the heterogeneity of the published studies with regard to study setting. Some use studies in the inpatient, Others do the study in the emergency. Some use clinical scoring for evaluation. Then the inclusion criteria are also uh, different. And may some of these studies, the patients have received adjuvant bronchodilators and others have not. Therefore, all this affects when you do a meta-analysis or uh, the comparison of the studies. These all become a problem. Now, the interpretation, if, the, if this is not enough, the interpretation is further complicated by the variability of the reported outcomes with a length of stay and admission rate data generally regarded as having greater clinical rele relevance than clinical scope. Therefore, some outcome, somebody uh, looks at the admission rate, some looks at the length of stay in the in inpatients and some use clinical scope. But all this, therefore, there is problem in comparing the studies. Now let's look at some of the research studies. Having uh, gone through some of the problems which you have in research studies, let's look at some of the research studies. Now, a Cochrane review published in 2013 analyzed 11 randomized control studies that had been published. The authors concluded that hypertonic saline reduces the length of stay, uh, the length of stay among hospitalized infants and improved clinical severity scores in both outpatient and inpatient population. Everything was very rosy in the beginning, 
But unfortunately, this meta-analysis, as I already pointed out, included studies that study that included study that suffered from significant design heterogeneity, relatively small sample size, and subsequent studies negated the above finding. Now, the AAP stepped in, the American Academy of Pediatrics, as suspected, stepped in in 2014, and they said that preponderance of evidence shows that 3% saline is safe and effective at improving symptoms in mild to moderate bronchiolitis after 24 hours of use in reducing the hospital stay, length of stay, LOS is length of stay in settings in which the duration of stay is typically more than three days. This is a very loaded, important statement. What they said, it's effective only in IP patients. It is effective when the patient has a moderate to severe uh, bronchi moderate bronchiolitis at least, which requires the patient to stay more than three days. If it is mild bronchiolitis, which goes in a day or two, it doesn't show any significant effect. Now, this is important because we will come back. Some of the British studies have shown more effect in the emergency rather than in the admitted patients. Now, they have also pointed out, as I already said, that it has not been shown to be um, uh, effective reducing hospitalization in emergency settings when in areas where the length of usage is brief. The way AP does not advise this to be given in the emergency. It's a funny uh, observation. Now, one very important thing which all of us have to remember is that uh, it has not been shown to be effective in intensive care studies or it has not been studied. Most of the interventions in bronchiolitis, whether it is bronchodilators or um, uh, hypertonic saline or even steroids, have not been studied in the intensive care settings because no longer ethical. For whenever we discuss about evidence in bronchiolitis, there is evidence only to mild to moderate bronchiolitis and not patients who are severe enough to be in the ICU. Well, as I already pointed out, the, the, uh, the, the hypertonic saline in the article in archives in 2015, they showed that the overall more recent randomized double-blind placebo-controlled trial suggests that for possible exception of a reduction in admission rates from ED, this is diametrically what, opposite to what the AAP said, the use of hypertonic saline does not have a clinical benefit in short-term clinical scores or long-term clinical outcome in acute bronchiolitis. They were indirectly meaning that it has no effect on the admitted patients. But even that, they, they said, pointed out that this difference in the admission rates from ED is not significant across the studies, Cochrane studies. Now, we come to more, I mean, the, one of the better studies which has been done and published again in the archives in 2015 was the Sabre study. This was an hypertonic saline in bronchiolitis, randomized controlled trial, and economic evaluation. It was not a very well, I mean, it was from the methodological point of view, it was not a very good study because it was an open label, non-blinded, it was a week from methodological perspective. Cyber identified randomized 317 infants to, per, to three person hypertonic saline nebulized every six hours from admission compared with nothing. This is the most important point compared with nothing. Well, what they meant is the study was pragmatic, consistent with recent clinical, recent clinical guideline recommendation from the UK and USA. Identified, now the point here is when they say sta standard care, normally in uh, Western countries, they don't give any, any other than hydration and oxygenation. Nothing else forms part of the treatment in good teaching hospitals. Therefore, they compared hypertonic saline not with a placebo, but with giving nothing. That is what it is. But it did not show any, it did not show any difference between the two arms of the study. Remember, that's a very important point to discuss. Now, a 2020 published study, prospective multicentric randomized clinical trial, uh, compared hy hypertonic saline with standard care. That is the same as the Sabre study. And they also found out that um, uh, in children below two years with moderate to severe bronchiolitis, they confirmed the Sabre findings. That is, it had no effect. Now, based on this, the guidelines have been Let's look at what the guidelines have been uh, talking about. What are the guidelines saying about hypertonic saline? 
In 2015, the NICE guideline recommends uh, against the use of hypertonic saline. Note the point, they, are, they have straight said that it, sh it should not be used. The sign guideline, which is a sort of Scottish guideline, does not discuss hypertonic saline. Now, uh, after I, have, I blogged on this, I got a lot of input from some of the consultants who are, who are even now practicing in NHS in UK. They told me they don't regularly use hypertonic saline in bronchiolitis, but it seems to be having some effect on patients who have a, some other co comorbidity, especially high patients with uh, quadriplegic cerebral palsy and degenerative uh, CNS disease. I didn't find any particular evidence to that basis, but that seems to be some of the opinion from abroad, which they gave their opinion on my blog site. Now, AAP recommends the 2014 recommendation stands even now. They have not made any change on it. And uh, normally Americans love to differ from other guidelines. The hypertonic saline should not be administered to infants with a diagnosis of bronchiolitis in the emergency department, but may be administered to infants in children hospitalized for bronchiolitis. This could be the result of a different uh, definition which they have for bronchiolitis, including all these patients, which the UK uh, uh, the, I mean, uh, studies don't include. Let's now summarize whatever we have discussed before we arrive at a conclusion, what, whether hypertonic saline should be used or not used in bronchiolitis. But what did we discuss? We first discussed the pathophysiological reason why this came into uh, practice. It has similarity with the pathology of cystic fibrosis and it all already being used very commonly in cystic fibrosis in the Western countries. The way we also discussed the problems and then the first problem is in research being the lack of internationally recognized definition, uniform definition and heterogeneity of the studies. Some, uh, some of the studies being done in inpatient, some being done in the emergency, etc. The earlier studies, what stood out was that some of the earlier studies did show some benefit, especially the Cochrane review, but the subsequent better studies probably did not show so much benefit except the American Academy of Pediatrics which uh, did an analysis and found out that they, uh, the patients who were moderately bronchiolitis, with bron moderate bronchiolitis who were admitted in the hospital for more than three days did have benefit. The emergency department it did not decrease the admission. Now, the 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 the, uh, the uh, how do we practice hyperton whether we give hypertonic saline or other uh, not probably does not depend on the uh, on the evidence of hypertonic saline but somewhere else now sleep rest and good hydration does far more for an infant with bronchiolitis than regular disturbance with intervention that either do not work or are questionable benefit now, the most important thing which helps in the bronchiolitis management are sleep, rest and hydration and probably oxygenation. Now, to do less is to do more for the recovery of child with bronchiolitis. Therefore, 50 years ago observation that oxygen therapy is vitally important. This oxygen therapy is vitally important in bronchiolitis and there is li little convincing evidence that any other therapy is consistently or occasionally holds good even today. Therefore, this is the fundamental, this is a, these are the overriding importance, uh, important thing in the management of bronchiolitis. Now, therefore, in that, you have to keep it in mind that, therefore, how do you, this is what guides the treatment more than the evidence in hypertonic saline. Well, what would be the management? Therefore, do not treat routinely in the emergency department or admitted patient with nebulized hypertonic solution of any concentration, 3% or 6% or 9%. Regular nebulization with hypertonic saline or any medication bronchiolitis does more harm than good by disturbing the child. That is the thing, if you disturb a child. Therefore, when, therefore when you have a child who is sleeping, who is mildly, mild to moderate distress is there, but is stable on, hyper, on oxygen, and uh, his SpO2 is about 94, probably even about 92 may be acceptable. It is better not to disturb the patient with any intervention. But on the 
That's what I mean by that. And therefore, we're writing sixth hourly, fourth hourly nebulizers for bronchiolitis as we write for asthma is not a good practice at all. But the, when the child is in distress, on the other hand, you find a child in distress and awake and deteriorating probably. And that is the SpO2 is dropping and you feel the patient might uh, require ICU or HDU care. It may be pragmatic to try one or two nebulizers with hypertonic saline and continue only if improve is observed. improvement is observed. If there is an improvement for that particular patient, that you can continue using it. Therefore, this is, therefore, even in the world of evidence, your experience does count. And when you give this hypertonic saline, please stand by the patient initially and observe for the improvement. And rarely, there have been paradoxical deterioration of bronchospasm also. Now, this is part of the pediatric end theory practice wordprocess.com. I blog on this. I blogged on several other matters, so several other clinically important things. And uh, this is a pre pediatric clinical decision aid. This is evidence-based, up-to-date pediatric practice. And uh, I would I did normally dissect one clinically relevant bedside pediatric issue at a time, like I did, uh, today I discussed about nebulized saline. I would be looking forward for you to visit this blog site, read it, and put your opinion in that. And I am Dr. A. Padmanabhan, a practicing pediatrician with more than 35 years of experience, with experience in primary, secondary, and tertiary care, both in India and abroad in teaching and non-teaching institutions. Thank you for listening.